So we're back, right? And we left off, we were talking about myth and the idea of pre-literate, right? That not, we haven't always had the, the written language, all that stuff, right? And what these myths are is that they're part of that oral tradition, the time when we were pre-literate. And these took the, story, the form of stories, poems, plays. Of course, if you take a poem and you put it to music, it's a song, it's really easy to remember, right? So all of this is going on there. So now, what do these myths, what do these stories, poems, and plays do, right? They explain the unexplainable and humanity's relationship to the ultimate. So you're probably thinking, okay, let me, I'm gonna, let me pause this while I copy this down, Mr. K, but I want an example. So here's an example of a myth, right? Something that explains the unexplainable. One thing that I've always want to have explained to me is why are people, why are human beings so selfish, right? You've, you've probably noticed this. Why are we so disobedient? Yeah, yeah, as a parent, I've wondered this all the time. Why are people so disobedient? And even myself as an adult, I still have this urge to be disobedient. Why is that, right? You could think of probably an example you might be familiar with. If, if you're a parent or if you have a niece or nephew, right, and it was that child's birthday and little Mary and you said, Mary, you know, since it's your birthday, Tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna, I'm gonna bake you a cake and we'll do it together. And Mary's like, oh, oh, that's great, Dad. So then you say, what's your favorite kind of make? Cake, Mary. And then Mary says, chocolate, okay. And then she says, I want a double layer cake. And you're saying, yeah, that's great, we're gonna do it together, right? So you get the cake pans and the cake mix, you do everything right, and you do that. And then you bake those two separate things, right? Now, and Mary says, let's ice it, let's ice it. But then you say, no, we, we can't do that yet. Right, because if you ice those sheet cakes, right, if you ice any cake before, when it's still warm, before it cools, it's going to tear. But if you go through all this, you know, talking to a, a three-year-old, it's, it's not going to happen. So when you say, okay, here's the deal. We'll come back in 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll ice the cake. Don't touch the cake. And then you leave the kitchen. And then the child goes and does something, and then it's too quiet. And you know what? It's too quiet, and you're a parent. Something is bad. Something has happened. Exactly. So then you look in the kitchen, and what has Mary done? What has little Jimmy done? Well, they've reached up here. She's reached up, and they're just got gobs, and they're touching the cake, and it's by that point, it's game over. It's ruined. Right? I've always wondered, why are we so disobedient? Well, there's a story, a myth, right? Now, when we use the word myth, we have to use it in the context of religious studies, academic studies, right? So this is what it means that explains this. Once upon a time, you might be saying, why, Mr. K, why are you saying once upon a time? Well, that's a, this is a story, right? Once upon a time, there were two people, and the world was relatively new at this time, and man, they had it good. They had it so good that they didn't have to work, that there was abundant food, they never got sick, this couple, and nothing bad became of them and life was joyful bliss. And in fact, it was so much that they were in ultimate contact, they were in contact with the ultimate at all times, that they walked with the holy. And this couple today we call Adam and Eve. And the ultimate God gave them one rule, right? You've probably heard this story, right? They only had one rule, y'all. And there was a certain tree in a certain part of the garden. What's the name of this garden? That's right. That they weren't supposed to mess with. Don't, you know, that, the, the, that fruit of that tree over there? Mm -mm. Everything else? Fine. But what did they do? Mm, yeah, mm, 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 mm. and then they get in trouble. Now, it's because of that that we're all children of Adam and Eve that we have that tendency to be disobedient. 
And also because of that, we have the tendency to be selfish. And if you go, oh, no, that's not true, Mr. Kent. Yes, it is true. If you don't believe me, just drive any place and see, instead of people letting somebody else out in traffic from a store or let somebody else go first in line at a store, oh, no, we scrunch up right to that car's bumper. We don't want people to get out in front of us. No, we're naturally disobedient. We're naturally selfish. So now, right, somebody thinking, okay, yeah, I got gotcha. you. So now, right, people for thousands of years have been asking this question, right? Why are we this way? So this story answers it. It explains that, right? And it also helps to understand, for us to understand our relationship to the ultimate that we call God. Exactly right. Now, so that's what these myths do. Now, when we gather myths, right, when they're gathered, they're gathered into a mythology. So, right, so we have Christian mythology, we have Jewish mythology, right, Hindu mythology, all that. And then what we can do is we can look at different gatherings of myths, different mythologies, and now we have the plural. So that's what we have here. Now, inside of myths, inside of mythologies, what we can do is we, when we study these mythologies, when we study all these different myths, not just inside of one religion or culture, but many, we start to see something really, really cool. And what we start to see is, now, what are archetypes, patterns found in different mythologies? Now, this is the key here, patterns. So, in other words, what we can find is a basic pattern or model that we find in different mythologies. For example, what's common in many different world religions is the idea of a bath in water that provides a, it's, it's not only physically refreshing like, like taking a bath or a shower is, but it's a cleansing not only of the outer body, but of the inner body to remove sin, right? Now, this archetype is found in Christian as well as in Hindu. And in addition, the act of ritual bathing is also in Islam as well as in Judaism. And then people go, wait a second, Mr. K, so are you saying that Christianity and Hinduism and Judaism and Islam are all the same since they do the same thing? And the answer is, Nope. What happened is that right again, they came up with story that explained the unexplainable, right? And then that's an archetype. And we find these in different religions, different cultures. <coughs> Excuse me. And one thing that's, that's, that's so amazing is that this leads us to a really broad you know, it helps us to have a big understanding and to see the world in a different way because we tend to think that I am the only person who does something, something special, something unique, right? If you think about in terms of worship or something. And that's, that's, that's not true. Different people in different times and different cultures and different religions have been doing these same things, right? And so again, these archetypes, these are patterns that are found in different mythologies. So as we go th through and deeper and we start to study more, we'll start to see these patterns and these are archetypes. Then the last thing for us to talk about is this, this word here, phenomenological. Say it with me, phenomenological. Now, the phenomenological approach is the approach that we're going to be using in this class. What the phenomenological approach is, it's you approach things in terms of phenomena, in terms of occurrences. 
So what the phenomenological approach does, it observes. What we do not want to do is judge. We're not looking at these different religions in terms of being right or wrong, true or false. But we're just looking at them as students. We're all students, especially me. And that's what we do with the phenomenological approach. So the phenomenological approach is not judging. It's observing. We're not interested in proving these things or looking at them in terms of true or false, valid or invalid. So that's again, we're just kind of getting started here. Hopefully picked up something from these brief lectures, laying the foundation here as we continue to move forward. So uh, until we're together again, be well, do good work, and keep in touch.